My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim Rugg. Today, man, we're going to talk about the Kurt Busiek, Alex Ross, Magnum Opus, one of their masterpieces, uh, Marvels. But first, we have some business to cover. My plugs this week, Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, the Image Comics full-color 240-page collection of all the Street Angel comics I did with Image, plus a few bonus ones, and Plain Jane's The Collection. These are my latest books, uh, a little bit... I didn't get to promote them as much as I wanted to due to due to COVID shutting down conventions, but perfect for a holiday time of year. So if you're looking for some books for uh, yourself or a loved one this holiday season, these are my latest. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscors, where I'm serializing my Red Room comic. What a contrast after looking at Plain Janes. <laughs> <laughs> Three bucks will get you the archive, blood, gore, splatter, grindhouse, uh, new strips every Tuesday, and uh, issue one is up there right now. But I also had some stuff come out this year, Jimmy, and the X-Men Grand Design Omnibus, that shit sold out. So let me sell this out, man. Uh, the Ed Piscor Studio Edition is selling out fast. Fantagraphics has a, a discount for like kind of like a Black Friday Hollywood uh, holiday sale. So uh, get it while it's hot. I think it's kind of cheap on Amazon, too. So if it's not in your comic shop, you could get it, uh, get it now while it's available. And, you know, we don't print up more of these uh, artist editions, man. So when this sucker's gone, it's gone. Plus, artist editions are great for Christmas. Agreed. I bought myself six. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. Marvels, Alex Ross, Kurt Music, 1994. Uh, we covered Flex Metallo last week, another mid 90s book. During the point in our lifetime where comics is probably at its absolute worst. And yeah, I think that's a fair description. And what were, what were the kind of beacons of light uh, in in that mid 90s period? I would say Flex was definitely something that ha people were talking about, but the Marvel uh, comic that kind of didn't fit into that template of Urzat's Dark Knight, Grim and Gritty, is uh, Marvels. And honestly, Kurt Busiek was the guy around this time, man, to kind of like pull uh, the energy in directions other than, you know, alcoholic Iron Man and, and shit <laughs> like right. that. He did uh, Thunderbolts Comes Later, but around this time, a little after this time, was uh, one of my, probably the last Marvel comic that uh, that I had a subscription to, the 99 cent Untold Tales of uh, Spider-Man, drawn by Pittsburgh's Pat Pat Olive, and Al Williamson on inks, quite quite right, a bit. yeah, 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 and uh, you know they were these one and done stories. Uh, I am on record on this channel a bunch about the rules I had as a kid buying comics, and I didn't want big sprawling things that led me from you know uh, the Batman title into. Robin, you know, to to read the second part of the story, and Kurt Busiek took stuff back to the uh, to the essentials, man, and did these one and done Stanley esque full meaty stories for ninety nine cents when everything else was two two fifty to three bucks. You know, he's the guy. Like, he's the guy to make something like this. I think you bury the lead. When I see Marvels, to me, it's one hundred percent Alex Ross. This yeah. is the Alex Ross coming out party. It is, in my mind, the biggest comic of that time period. When I think back on it. It's hard to think of what else was like a standout or perennial that right. comes out of that time period. The interesting thing to me, this is a bright, beautiful comic. I like the color a lot. We'll talk about that as we're flipping through. But in the context of like Watchmen Dark Knight, everything, you know, still at this point is kind of following that. A lot of people emulating it with their dark and gritty, grim and gritty, as you say. But this one has a lot, owes a lot of, of debt to those comics. One is very realist, quote unquote, realistic take on superheroes. So that's kind of keeping in the flavor of what some people brought from Dark Knight and Watchmen. And then the other part, it's painted, which, you know, I think of the uh, artwork in Dark Knight. I realized there was line work on top of it. But one of the big pieces of that comic is the painted coloring from, from Lynn Varley. So, you know, there are some connections, I think, back to those works. And I, you can't do superheroes after Watchmen Dark Knight in 1986 without some sort of going along with what came out of those, going against what came out of those. But, I mean, it's a before and after in terms of superheroes. And this is very much, I think, in line with those comics, is continuing the conversation of how do you make superheroes interesting at this point. So we're going to, for, you know, perhaps an hour, we're going to be looking through the Alex Ross artwork of Marvels. But maybe we should take a quick look, sure. a glance, and see where, where his kind of starting off point when it comes to painted comics and uh, Alexander Ross right here. I love here. this. Reminds me of like Love and Rock, Rockets number one where we see the shells of the, the splash page and here we see that worm. Yeah. 
And his background is commercial art. Like he was doing storyboards and things for advertising out of Chicago. Yeah, which his, is where you know now was was headquartered. And he's a uh, he's a second generation illustrator, and we and we know a few second generation illustrators. We're friends with a couple, and they're badass motherfuckers, man. When you have that in your DNA, and you see it every day, and you know how to present artwork and prepare artwork and create a clean asset for your art director, um, that's those guys have a set of tools, man. That we just don't they got their 10,000 hours far before we did they sure do and it's remarkable how much Marvel's was like Ross just showed up like this existed before that this was not a talked about book no I was buying comics at this time I used to see some of the now Terminator comics on newsstands this registered none this didn't move the needle for anybody wizard wasn't covering it until after Marvel's came out and it was like oh his early work this did not get any coverage whenever it was first published so Marvel's really was like, holy shit, this brand new superstar has just walked through the door. In a weird way, he's sort of the, the promise that uh, Stephen Platt was the Flash. Ross shows up and he's kind of the substance, the real deal of like, here I am. Everybody start, or you know, <laughs> comics start orbiting around me. And Marvel would do like a series of painted, you know, high-end books following this that were really, really bad imitations of, of Ross. Right. Um, you know, so it, it did start that trend. Of course, he goes on to Kingdom Come at DC. Like, this was the launch of the Alex Ross brand. Yes. Brand is a good term, too, because you go to San Diego Comic-Con and you see the real estate that he has. I bet it costs... I bet altogether, like, it's at least $50,000 worth of real estate traveling and uh, promotional materials because he's got stuff hanging from the ceiling of... San Diego Comic Con's convention hall. You know he is a big operation. Uh, it's it's tchotchkes. Like he he'll do a cool painting and put it on like a Franklin Mint plate that uh, the fanboys will buy or something like that. But listen, man, the dude's uh, raking it in. Yeah, no doubt about it. And you mentioned illustrator. It's a really good description for for Ross. Yeah, I, I think of him as illustrator first and cartoonist somewhere else. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and and I don't mean to that to sound as bad as it does like he when applied right i think the skill set that he brings is phenomenal and i don't think it ever looks better than it does in marvels it's it's you know we talk about it the matrix of the qualities that go into an artist and you can't pin on red on all the right. attributes you know what i'm saying man so when you really dig into an artist's work and you and you try to take it apart to the nuts and bolts level um you can kind of come up with a profile of what's important to that cartoonist where where do they place their value and a lot of his value man is it's in realism well good lighting stuff like that man uh the storytelling and sometimes even the compositions kind of uh take 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 second fiddle man so here's the format for each of the four issues issue one golden age issue two is an interesting one and i can't wait to, to talk about that because it's we're getting into Silver Age, but the X Men are you know the the bastard children of the Marvel Universe of the of the Stanley Kirby era are the focus of this. And there's a cool I have something cool to go along with that. Uh, the Great Galactus trilogy, of course, is going to be the focus here. And one of the comics for for that generation ahead of us, Jimmy, the Gwen Stacy Spider Man stuff was so important to those dudes. Oh yeah. It's come up in conversation a lot of times in our travels. Yeah, good friends in the comics industry, uh, old timers, guys that exactly. have this history that were buying those comics new at the time, have talked to us about how that moment changed their lives. <laughs> you know, in, in some ways, their relationship with comics changed drastically, <laughs> despite still being around decades later involved. But it was like that moment really changed something. And the conceit of this series is this is a, uh, it's a this tour. is using the actual events of the Marvel. Hi this is Marvel history, yeah, which a is a good concept. You know, we all were familiar with what we're going to see in here, but certainly, even if we had read the original issues, this is a very different presentation of those events. Kurt Busiek, he 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 clearly read this stuff in in some of the collections and and later materials that come out from this. His thank you list is basically the guys who let him borrow. <laughs> uh, they're, they're golden and silver age comics that he didn't have access to. So right off the bat, we're, this is pre-World War II, 1939, the birth of comics. Alex Ross employs that sepia tone that we associate with like daguerreotype old school photographs, that silver metal highlight film that fucking is literally flammable. 
I'm going to point this out from the get-go. One of the things that makes this series work for me is the contrast between regular people exactly. and, and then making the superheroes look like superheroes, marvels, gods. And it, Ross does a great job with that. We're going to see regular people over and over. And they're very well lit and a little bit glamorized. And it's a very clean environment for the 40s. But it does ground it all. Like, it is people. It lo they look like people. Sure. And so when you see the superheroes, you get that nice pop of, like, color, scale, power stances. All the things that make them look godlike. Page page one, you have uh, Phil Sheldon is going to be our uh, avatar character who's going to take us through the whole tour of the Marvel Universe from, from the normal people perspective. Yeah, a, a journalist photographer. Yeah, photographer to start. And uh, here goes a young J. Jonah Jameson. They kayfabe the shadows under the nose a little bit to mm -hmm. kind of like sell you on uh, the future. It is crazy that, I mean, even growing up, you, you know who Hitler is before you know who J. Jonah Jameson is? So when you see J. Jonah, it's like he has a Hitler mustache. They're talking about Hitler yeah. and kind of like creating that little shadow there. And who are the first uh, Marvel superheroes, man? You had Human Torch. You had... Uh, Namor the Submariner. He kills the torch. His torch is so good. Yeah. Like uh, his ability to capture light. And I read this on my iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have some of the issues. I don't have them all. So I, I was looking at this original source material. But on the iPad, you get that backlighting. Yeah. And let me tell you, torch is like on fire. Wait, like this is very close to uh, the the Carl Burgos in a certain fashion. You know, obviously it's more raw back in the day and stuff. But it's you know it's a suit. It's on fire. When uh, we get to the Kirby area where there's like an iconographic human torch, you know, Ross, Ross couldn't do what Kirby did. It would look, look odd. So he, you know, he kept that shit rocking, man. Um, once again, the, those sepia tones of what we associate with like old time photography, he, he can capture these periods really well. So it's like, not only is he referencing photos and he's one of those guys like you could see it in neil adams as well like whenever you get a shot of them at their desk they flood their tabletop surface with photographs and right. stuff while they're uh putting putting the illustrations together so like one panel could be you know it could be 50 photographs that they're looking at to try to capture that that stuff and one of the things that uh ross is is noted for is all the kind of easter egg materials that he that he includes in his comics so there's like a Fleischer Brothers uh Clark Kent Lois Lane there's like a Billy Batson in here and you know he uses so many photos and from all over the place that like you know this is Phil Sheldon and we saw him on page one but this looks like a George Reeves Clark Kent so it's like two facing Clark Kent's with one another that's pretty impressive just as an illustration the reflection of them looking at in the uh, window shopping for jewelry reading up on uh some interviews and stuff ross said that he really wasn't used to wet media when he was putting these co yes. these comics together markers uh color pencils. color pencils um oils and acrylics so we're we're gonna watch him kind of like solidify that that style that we really associate him with it's a little bit soft focus here at the beginning. That's amazing. Again, the lighting the lighting throughout this is, is really stellar, but the stuff with the human torch to me is some of the funnest lighting where like he's figuring out a way to like it's underlit. You know, like a lot of the under what should, would be shadows in a normal person is white. This shit right here, this is wire season 2. Ziggy and Nico <laughs> are talking and Ziggy's like, "Yeah, they took my car, man. They took my car. It sucks." And then they turn the they hear a ruckus. They turn the corner, and then Method Man, Cheese, has the car on fire. And this is an era where the people are talking. You know, my grandfather, I remember him telling me about seeing King Kong on, on TV and, like, being scared, or, or in the theater and being scared to death. Like, it was like it was real. And I think, believe it or not, like, gorillas to, like, Western civilization were discovered in, like, the late 1800s or yes. something. So it's like, monsters are out there. Big, big, foots are, big feet are out there. You know, have that in mind. When you put yourself in the position of these people right here, seeing this like literal human torch. Some of this stuff's a little bit heavy handed. You know, I would read this and think like, man, he's Busiak's really laying it on thick and, mm -hmm. and, and going over the same material several times. But it's moments like that, you know, like they, they do well in terms of establishing how how marvelous this stuff is. 
Uh, and sometimes they do it a little heavy handed, go a little bit further than maybe they need to, but it is effective. It does really paint this picture, like you say, of these people who had never seen anything like this and it changed their, you know, they saw it and it was like, they'll never forget that image of a guy on fire right. running down the street. I, I, I'd i like to sit down with, with Busiek. I had some small correspondence with him at the beginning of like when X-Men Grand Design was getting put together. I have some thought. I have some things that I'm curious about, and he doesn't do it all the time. And I wonder if this is a writing stroke that is indicative of the Golden Age comics, because when it came to captions and imagery, it's show and tell. And Busiek is a, you know, he's a good writer, man. He doesn't do that in most of his stuff, but right here, he very much does. And I wonder if that's a writing nod to the writing of those Golden Age comics, because it's like the police. They shot him. So we see the police shoot him. Bullets didn't hurt him at all. Doesn't look very, you know, stunned. He picked up a police car. There's him picking up a police car and threw it. He threw the car. There's him throwing the car. He leaped back into the water. Here's him leaping back into the water. When I, you know, this is just a couple pages in. And I was thinking like, oh no, Kurt, what are you doing? What are you doing to us, man? But it's just pretty much on this page. You know, he's getting, he's really good with like internal monologue and, and, and adding to the panels with the rest of his captions. But just this piece right here, I wonder if that's like a specific, cause, because it's kind of glaring compared to the rest of the writing. Yeah, I don't know. This is a really, uh, this is a kind of book you could hand somebody that doesn't read comics and I think they would get it and be into it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think that writing is helpful. The uh, sure, show yeah. and tell part. And especially if he eases it in. You know, when I mentioned that some of it's heavy handed, it's things like building up Gwen Stacy. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think he's pretty confident in what he's doing here. And I don't think that's a bad approach in the beginning, at least to sort of like get some people. It's ballsy to think like I'm making an iconic work here. That's going to be around for years and years and years. I don't know that he knew that, sure. but it really does work for somebody. If you wanted to hand someone a comic, you know, a fan of the Marvel movies or whatever, and you hand them this for a Christmas gift, almost anybody I think could read this and enjoy it. I do think that this is like the Marvel perennial. It's like yes. they're, they're of the of the big two. They're sort of they're lagging behind the book packaging and book market part of of the business compared to at least what DC was. Who knows what the hell they're they're up to these days? Uh, but this is the perennial. You know, like what what else what else is there? Born again, maybe, but I don't know that that is constantly in print. So we had our Fleischer Brothers Superman appearances right here. How about the Nighthawks right. painting? Right here. Another uh, thing with Alex Ross that applies to us, and I don't know if you saw this, but he had a big show at the Andy Warhol Museum here in Pittsburgh a couple years ago, and I think it was their biggest attended show. 20 years ago. Was it really that long? <laughs> it's a long time ago. I remember seeing, like, Chip Kidd came in for a talk as part of it, but it was awesome. Like, they showed his childhood comics that he made, yeah. which were, like, you know, crayons and, and colored pencils on, on lined paper and stuff. That was really awesome. But you see a lot of that process and you kind of see a context for this. Like the Nighthawks piece, I see lots of like, like a Norman Rockwell, right? Yeah. Um, at least in spirit when it comes to this kind of Americana. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that sanitized a antiseptic kind of, uh, picture of people. And it plays to his strength as advertising and commercial art. Like, you know, that, that was kind of his trade. And you see it on, in this in these kind of crowd scenes in this kind of setting. A lot of fan service. So for for noobs, there's an overarching story. But for you know the the diehard, uh, you got lots of cool little fan service moments like Martin Goodman, the original publisher of uh, the Daily Bugle. Martin Goodman, of course, is the original publisher of uh, of Marvel Comics and uh, big cousin uncle to uh, Stan Lee. One of those characters that they never even really bothered to, to bring back was that character, the Angel, from mm -hmm. uh, from Marvel Comics one. So there's his little cameo right there. He he gets better and better, like over these pages of like softening the focus of the background and like really uh, giving you good hard contrast on like the focal point characters. Some of this stuff's really fun too. Whenever he goes off of model, and what I mean is like, he's not. He works a lot from photographs that he sets up. Yeah, with lighting. It's very controlled. And that stuff's okay, it has its place, but the stuff, I like to see him go off of that too. You know, right. It can be very stiff if that's all you do. And when he gets into some of these like recreating old moments or comic covers and stuff, it's a chance to kind of see him paint a little bit or go a little bit out of his imagination, let's say. Yeah. This composition though, man, like even as a kid, I was like, uh, could, could you have like bent that, that bar 
a little and and once again that's like pointing out you know where does the cartoonist like lay put their values he's working all this stuff out you see what his thumbnail sketches look like in in extra stuff so like he drew this in sketch form and was like yeah that's that's a good composition i always loved his pencil drawings yeah they really blow me away and you see him you can find a lot of his process people watching it this if you haven't heard of alex ross or you want to see more there's tons out there and his pencil pencil sketches always just amaze me so this first issue is uh <laughs> keeping in the golden age spirit submariner's a good bad guy he's a good guy he's a bad guy he's a good guy over and over again and it creates this feeling within the normal people of new york of almost distrust uh you know like they're very happy whenever you know the the human torch and and namor kind of are battling a nazi but you can't quite trust them because the you know the next minute they're gonna rob a bank or something i find this all super effective Busiak typed out all these articles and pasted it and, and would create like uh, hard copies yeah that Alex Ross would then work on multimedia to get, you know, some shading on them to look like newspapers. There are some great panels of this, especially when it gets into more of like a color setting. But, you know, again, you see kind of the uh, the little Easter eggs, you know, the classic Captain America character sketch. But I think Captain America in these kind of black and white photos, these are these are great. This is a hit. You think of you think of, you know, the propaganda newsreels of, of the He-Man G, of G.I. Joe and they're keeping in that spirit. And I think they probably even lifted some of this stuff for that first Captain America movie. Probably. Like I, I haven't seen it since that time. But I, I remember there being like a newsreel that people were watching and getting very excited about. There's Boeing in this typography to go along with that. And if you look really close, you can see the paste-ups. Very fun. There's a, uh, they released this as an annotated version recently. Yeah. And uh, that's what I was actually reading. So it calls out all these Easter eggs, but it also has things like recreating those those pieces, all the press pieces that Buziak writes. Right. Uh, and it's it's a pretty clever presentation of that stuff, but man, the work. So Popeye there in your first panel, right? Popeye, yeah, like right next to uh, Nick Fury. And look at that, man. He's got a little shadow, a little <laughs> shadow on the eye to kind of foretell his uh, purple heart. Once again, man, I really like these soft focus backgrounds where, you know, we get our main f focus and soften that stuff up and it gets expressionistic because he's so literal in so much of what he does when he just kind of like shows us a couple brushstrokes to sell us on you know a front door it's pretty cool airbrush is another uh, implement that he uses and he'll just like use little little spritzes of it here and there to add illumination to things some more propaganda footage when namor's a good guy and uh, they <laughs> those covers back in the day are absolute jingoistic propaganda pieces, man. And, and you know, the dehumanization of the, our Japanese enemies was all over those old covers. So they had to tone that stuff down for certain. And again, I point out the great use of black and white. You know, yeah. the color throughout this is pretty impressive. I rail against color so often that, like, as this series goes on, we're going to see more and more great use of color. But even in black and white, it's a great use of color. It puts that stamp on it of like old film of a time period at least, and variety. At least at the time, uh, because obviously this guy was such a huge hit uh, that million interviews back in those days, like right when I discover uh, Wizard Magazine, all of his pieces start out at this level, probably not with this much dark contrast, but he does essentially a gouache, ink wash, a, a black and white wash uh, or gray wash and then applies the color over top. So it all kind of starts from this place. And that harkens back to, you know, the old illustrative adage, man, it's got to work as a black and white image before you apply color. One of the big noteworthy uh, uh, Easter eggs here too, and this is super nerdy, is that uh, that's like the shadow in like Doc Savage. And the idea is the old pulp heroes are seeing the next wave before their eyes, you know? That's a good one. That's something I, I did not pick up on my own. It's a great detail note, and it makes sense. It yeah. feels like, especially Kurt Busiak, I can't imagine the uh, amount of research that goes into something like this. A lifetime. I mean, this comic, these guys are clearly fanboys in the, like, the, you know, the nicest sense of the word, I guess, you know? Like, they, they're they very well-read comics people, man. So it's not like it was sheetrocking a bathroom for them to, to read the old pulps and to like come up with, with these ideas. 
Look at that little milk sop fucking Phil Shelton, man. Little wuss. He's going to beef up a little bit when that war comes on. And once again, oscillating back and forth, man. We just we saw Namor be a good guy. Well, guess what? That shit ain't going to last for very long. And one of the big uh, sort of epic moments of those Golden Age comics uh, for Marvel was the first uh, crossover. You know, it was uh, Elemental, Water versus Fire, Human Torch versus Submariner. And, uh, of course, in that old comic, no consequence. Little island that's uh, bottlenecked with bridges and tunnels, and the big wave comes, and there were no casualties in the uh, Golden <laughs> Age comic. Man. Yeah, that's one of those pieces, if you want to add realism, <laughs> you start doing the math on the body counts of what happens after this. All right. <laughs> it's, uh, that's tough. This is a pivotal part of our storyline. Phil gets caught in the, uh, you know, in the fallout from this fight. Yeah. And uh, marking him for all time. And, of course, that mark is going to be the brick to the eyeball. Another good uh, sort of technique is just like the speed, the speed blur effect with the, with these bricks here. So now he's an eyeless photographer. Once again, loving the color of the, uh, you know, he's losing his eye and suffering. But in a way, this is what bonds him to these marvels. You know, they mark him for life. And the next thing we see are these beautiful colors of the flowers, but also that out of focus, wet on wet watercolor effect behind him. Even his skin tone looks more vibrant, which is funny in a hospital setting. I always think of hospitals as like, Drab. man, if you're going to go desaturated, that's the place to do it. Right. But it's the change in him. And that's kind of, uh, for me, this series picks up after this first issue. So that's the moment. That's kind of the turning point in a lot of ways. And maybe this two page spread is the culmination of that turning point. I love this piece when I was a kid, Ben. It does call back to those Alex Schomburg covers, man, where there's just a million little guys, the heroes descending. The Invaders was a 1970s invention by Roy Thomas. This is the all winner squad right here. And again, the color. This is the all saturated version, too. First time we see Captain America in his, in his royal blue. Uh, you know, a little you bucky see, with that gat. It's almost the flowers around that hospital bed are these heroes, and it really is like, okay, it's on now. The heroes are here. Now we're going to get three issues of, of, like, let's get a good look at these guys. Yeah, man. And that jumping into action, that always reminds me of, like, Ultimates number one, but it's very common throughout. There, there are a lot of comics you can find that moment of the heroes, like, parachuting, jumping into whatever they're going to do. Right. All right, man, so let's launch into our... Uh... Love this cover. You know, it, it, it paints a picture, man. It tells you a story. Like, you can see real angry mob underneath and, and the angel flying away. Oh, and, man. And this is, yeah, this is, and this is the, the saving grace to the story because this is a pretty tough one. Great stuff in this one, too. Cool to see them. Well, we'll get to it. But there you go, Captain America and glorious Technicolor. On our shores, you know. So he vanquished the, the uh, foreign threat. Now he's going to do some domestic work. I love it. I love the uh, I love the blue. You know, it's a big part of superheroes that has not translated to, to screen is that fashion and particularly the saturated colors. He looks awesome. And then like running, you know, running across the car tops into battle. Yeah, it's great. Good point of view, man. Just from, like, you know, the, the citizen's eye perspective. And you never get a good look like you, you see them. They always get the view from behind. You know, you never get like a good front on shot. And that is the gimmick of this series, the human human point of view of these superheroes. Yeah. It's such a good concept. It's such a good way to present superheroes, especially at this time when nobody had really done it this way. <laughs> There's this, like, what is this gunk? Is that is that Paste Pot Pete? <laughs> <laughs> you got me. One of those one of those uh, Kirby, Kirby characters that didn't uh, translate after. Now, this is one of those I iconic right. pieces, man, that uh, you would see in all of the promotional uh, materials. And I bet you when... This comes into the bullpen. Everybody's hovering around like... It's amazing because this was used on at least one of the trade paperback covers. Mm -hmm. And it's inside of a round circle for your camera lens. So the crotch is literally the center of the page if you drew an X. <laughs> and this arrow is like pointing at it. It's one of the more bizarre compositions you'll ever see. Iconic. This is a great image. But man, they crop it up where it is just like crotch shot on the cover, front center, and arrow and directional devices pointing at it. You see that uh, Ross is a uh, Kirby aficionado, so uh, Giant Man is a eunuch. <laughs> <laughs> I think, wasn't uh, DC in the uh, Flatiron building for a certain point, or EC Comics was in Flatiron building? There was a publisher in there for, and maybe there still is, but I, I'm not sure. 
And Phil's trying to sell this book is what he's doing at this publisher. Photo book of, yeah. of all of his iconic shots. And he even wants a shot at writing it. So this is where we launch into his journalistic uh, career. Got an, got an angry mob. He, when, he, when he leaves the publisher, angry mob running down the street. And he, uh, he, jumps, he jumps on board, man. Man, this is, this is some good, good stuff. We've seen glorious, beautiful, bright heroes in the daylight. And now you see the, uh, the flip side of that coin. The, the hated X-Men at night, mob around them, and that red light. His approach to the X-Men is, is, uh, is fantastic with this red light. Like when uh, you bust out um, the first grand design and like in the, uh, the uh, credits page, I, uh, it's, all, it's all red stuff. And I pulled it from here. And my idea was that it's the shot right after when they leave because they blow a hole through a wall and, and roll through. They're like demons from hell with this lighting. It's incredible. Yeah. It's very cool, too, as a story that you're able to get both the good guys and the bad guys without deviating from the most popular characters. Even gets a little emotion on Snowball-Headed Iceman's face. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's, this is a good Phil, Phil Sheldon moment, too, because uh, I think we've all, certainly as kids, we've all done something that we almost immediately regret once you see the, the, the uh, immediate results. He throws a brick at the mutants, and it's the words of Cyclops that fuck him up, man. Forget about it. They're not worth it. And that's going to be a repeating almost uh, mantra in his ears as he uh, progresses. This is kind of like a character, a, a change in his arc. Yeah, this is good stuff. And throwing that brick, you know, it's almost a, a what happened to him payback moment. Right. Which is something he wrestles with a little bit. You know, the idea of what these characters, what these superheroes actually mean in their lives. And it is part of uh, Cyclops' comment, you know, it's, it's all part of the soup that he's that he's dealing with. Yeah. All right, man. Phil Sheldon, he's a family man. Just got married to his old lady in that last issue. Now he's got uh, some shorties rocking. This this story's structured really, really well. Yes. As And all of these, they more or less work as a unit. Going through the tour of the Marvel Universe, there's parts where things jump, like very drastically but like this one as a unit is is a very strong beginning middle and end because here we go with the red he's now in his in his dark room developing these photos and it's the same exact color scheme we saw with the x-men and you instantly think like what are we what what's going on here you know why do this callback and it's almost like he's part of this he's complicit he's making his money from this same stuff that in some cases are being vilified on the streets and attacked and he's part of it right here's another uh you know citizen's point of view and all you get is, uh, you know, another Thor cr crotch shot. <laughs> These crowd scenes are pretty Im impressive. Yeah, like, not only is it a well-composed crowd, but, like, he's painting in known people. Mm -hmm. He's painting in, like, celebrities. You know, Norman Osborn shows right. up right next to, I guess it's probably, like, Elizabeth Taylor or so. And, you know, this is probably some famous actor who I don't know. Um, reading some of the annotated stuff, he said that his his idea of Reed Richards is the professor from uh, Gilligan's Island. That's funny. It really looks like it there. And his idea was to like just try to keep the Kirby shape to to her face as much as possible. And hair, that hair is great. Yeah, they're they're at a uh, a sculpting exhibit of Alicia Masters. Yeah, which is perfect. What it's such a genius concept. This whole that that whole scene is just perfect. Tony Stark and Alicia Masters there in the top. And, you know, talk about what she's accomplished. We see in the back here, Matt Murdock having the same kind of experience of feeling out the daredevil that she made. Exactly, man. <laughs> and, and then uh, sneaking in in between these thighs right there. That's a Stephen Strange, if there ever mm -hmm. was. Probably the only appearance of uh, of Doctor Strange. I, I have I do have a confession to make, man. Uh, when when I was a boy, Timothy Dalton was, was my James Bond because I was on HBO every fucking day. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and there's an X-Men right there. Right. And I think we were all in agreement that Captain Picard had to be Professor X if there was ever going to be a movie. And I think Alex Ross is in that place with that image right there. I think that's in the annotated uh, is the, it? the editions of this. I'm pretty sure they, they mentioned that. There's an iconic right. mutant style bloody composition. That's again, like Rockwell. Your contrast between that nice, bright 
scene of these celebrities and superheroes mingling around and the people on the streets are just gray and drab. You can use gray. You know, it can be used well. <laughs> this feels like this feels like the trajectory of like a New York day whenever I'm in town. Because I'm only in town for events. I'm not there sure. just to fucking fuck off. So it's like you do your big thing and then it's time to go home and it's you know, it's it's lights, it's cabs, Very it's true. dark. The girls have a secret. We're building to to that. And the Fantastic Four have an announcement. They're building towards a the, the big wedding day, which, uh, you know, think of the time that's passed between, say, the early Marvel Universe and now and the way, you know, royal weddings and celebrity weddings and stuff would be covered in the press. It's perfect, this interpretation, that this is a huge deal and everybody's on board for this. I think I think they even handled it as such in, in the comics, like yeah. with the big splash page that they kind of call back to in, in here. Stilt Man. <laughs> Stilt Man versus Daredevil just never works and we never lose the contrast the reminder that the x-men that the mutants are not part of this superhero culture right another lynching also they're running the opposite way they were running you know to the to the right the first time now they're running to the left to go to go uh fuck somebody up yeah and phil running by himself the opposite direction it's good use the visuals gets back to the family and gotta give mad props to alex ross for this mutant design because those big eyes, you know, one of the strengths of manga, and when you watch Man Ben, the thing that they always focus on, every cartoonist to a T, is getting emotion in those eyes, and that's a part of the big eyes. That's amazing so, to, to do the, the manga reference with that. I never made that connection, and it's perfect. Page design, spread design, you want a cliffhanger, you want a reason to turn the page, that's your uh, that's your Bendis writing, the, uh, the story, Robert McKee, and here we have a perfect one, man. All we've heard about are the threats of mutants and what to do, and now we're stuck facing one. Yes. And almost in an instant, he sees the humanity in in the girl. You know, she was she was hungry, like she wouldn't have come by if she if she wasn't in dire straits. And there was tears. This is a little bit of your heavy handed uh, sure. writing part. Like, you know, if, if, in case we're not getting an Anne Frank reference in our head let's let's make sure you're getting one listen right. what we're talking about readers yeah yes it's probably not a wrong choice but it, it's one of those examples that we are going to show there's not it's a 12 year old can read this and make sure they don't miss anything it's it's a tough line with with, with uh with ross's you know photorealism because you can i think you can cross a line uh certainly you know if some re relative recognizes some of these people or something like that so you know that's a that's a tight rope for sure would have been a nice spot for like a master race reference you know to the old to the old ec comics if there was a panel composition or something that you could have pulled out of that just I, to be that inside you know just an easter egg there totally and uh judging by uh alex ross's studio layout and photographs i don't think he's ever read a comic that wasn't marvel or dc <laughs> couple more of these incredible written articles <laughs> that Buziak's writing all that and typesetting all of that. And this is that nerdy shit too, man, because this was in the comic. This was like a Werner Roth, like right post uh, Jack Kirby uh, headline on a, on a newspaper. That read and sue forever. That's perfect. Dude. <laughs> this when, must uh, exist. When, when, uh, during, uh, 2016, when I was at the, uh, in, in DC for, uh, the national book convention, um, there was a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like a fireman sale of all the Obama merchandise and, uh, new Trump 2016 shirts at the same thing. And the guys <laughs> at the little pagoda, come here, get your history. Come buy your history. <laughs> Culmination of events, man. There's the splash page money shot of the marriage between sue and uh and reed and it once again uh kirby, kirby did this splash in the comic yeah fun to see those whenever it's something you recognize yeah and, and there's quite a few of those sometimes they're very similar and sometimes it's like this is the scene but it's going through the alex ross marvel's point of view all that stuff's just real fun for a long time reader his thing is the the contrast that he gets with the rocks is probably one of my favorite uh characters that, that he paints and he gets a real good one in the next issue that rocky texture i think lends itself to painting and we're gonna uh, introduce the sentinels the famous uh debate that has been oft adapted in other media 
with, between Boulevard Trask and uh, Captain Picard as the uh, Sentinels go haywire. And the Sentinels, they, they split from that studio, man. They're, they're off to go capture a mutant. And our guy Phil has been warehousing uh, a, a little mutant at his house. He was involved in, you know, two to three of these lynchings. And he's like, if they find out that I, I'm housing a mutant at my crib, it's over. You know, my family's in, in mortal danger. This panel is slightly, uh, it's, it's surprising in this context. I think I've seen that photo. And that's, yeah, a, that's, so that's another one of the things where it's like, where, where do you draw the line? Like, great shot of these Sentinels. Bust out that airbrush a little bit. Yeah, neat effect too. It's almost alien or uh, godlike. You know? Yeah, pretty fun. I, and I'm gonna choose for there to be a happy ending to this man, because when he gets home after all the ruckus with the Sentinels and all that, turns out that the little girl, she uh, she split, took a little clothes, took a little food, she's gone, and the the daughters and mom, man, they're, they're all they're all distraught. Yeah, and, and his caption is, she was out there alone in that riding that we just saw in the Sentinels flying over, you know, looking for mutants. But here's the thing, Jim, you know, like I wanted I wanted more than anything to tell her that there was a happy ending. You know, you read the end, then you got to close the book. They put the last panel on the cover. You know, that's the same girl. Yes. The X-Men got her. I like that interpretation, Ed. Yeah. I love this issue. Good Man, one. he does. Uh, we talk about the thing being a good texture. That Silver Surfer, wow. And they got all the Kirby textures in there, too. This is the payoff I was talking about with, like, the newspapers and working that into his composition. I saw this page for the first time and was just in awe as a painting. The amount of work and detail that he puts into this piece, I'm so impressed by this. Yeah. That is not an easy thing to do. All those photos, magazine covers, brilliant. In perspective. And it's so bright. It's so saturated. You know, like the superheroes really are the technicali technicolor presentation because even this, it's bright blue skies, you know, warm colors, but it's not the same as those super saturated, like the photo of the superhero costume characters in costume. Right. It's like a different palette that he reserves for those superheroes. And this was a period where I guess the, uh, the, uh, the Avengers were, were getting, um, framed yeah and back and forth that's kind of the commentary their heels their their faces somebody set them up now they're back to avengers day page after page right and he and he write you know i mean that's phil's whole plight is like we don't appreciate these these people or these superheroes and look at eraser head man with the with the judgment day stuff we're going to see him at the end he also uh you know goes on and on about just he becomes totally faithful, almost like a religion, in his belief that these superheroes will always save the day. And this is probably an issue where it really cements that for him. Yeah. And there's a, there is a part, too, where like the people like sort of take it for granted that they almost expect that you know, the heroes are going to take care of things. Yeah, taken for granted is a good way to describe that. Our first uh, little, little glimpse of... Spider-Man there? I think he does a great Spider-Man. Yeah. The whole concept of Spider-Man throughout this is that he's this, like, kind of icky character. You know, there's a gross factor to him. Whether you think hero or villain, he, you know, he climbs around, he's slinky. It's the insect stuff. And Busiak and Ross do great together bringing that home without, like, we don't see anything disgusting or gross or overly caricatured, but together, man, they just paint this picture of this character that's He's mysterious enough that it's gross. Spider-Man's a little gross. <laughs> you could definitely tell that Ross was a mark for that uh, 70s TV show too, man. No doubt about it, and I'm glad that he is. You know, like, I think that works for these kind of visuals. It gives us something that we're already familiar with. You know, like, if Spider-Man were real, how would he look? Well, he might look different than the comics, like the TV show. Yeah, so you see some wrinkles that. in the fabric. This is the fun shit because that it's like... That is awe-inspiring. Yeah, it's it's like this over-the-top texture. It's this, And it's the stuff that was in the Kirby comic, you know? So it's we're seeing his graphic interpretation in color of Kirby texture. It's a terrific spread. Even the TV broadcaster guy I'm, I'm on board with. Like, it's good storytelling. There's a lot of cool... The format of this issue is great because, like, we're going to get a lot of splash pages on this side. So it's like every page turn is rewarded 
when when shit is really on, man. And this whole story, in my mind, is this giant story. The first time I read this story was in the Collected Treasury edition, so it was already oversized. Mm -hmm. But it's gods, it's characters that are way bigger than humans. It's perfect for this treatment of, like, reserve the double-page spreads for when we do Judgment Day. Well done. I do like the idea of uh, Alex Ross in his studio getting his friend to strip down to his tidy whiteies <laughs> to take that photo. <laughs> I like to imagine him painting him in some kind of color like uh, this the same stuff that, that made Buddy Epson not be able to be the Tin Man because it closed off all his pores. <laughs> That's terrific though. It's it's such a you good You feel surfer. the Kirby in it? Oh yeah. It's so much fun. Like this is the one that feels like the alien comic book concepts. Just great. Terrific. I'm surprised that it works. This is something if you showed me the first two issues, I'd be like Great. I don't know if you can do co the cosmic stuff in this style. Well, you can. There'll be one piece of Uncanny Valley that I'm going to be very happy to point out uh, in the in this issue. This is a reference. This ship that Galactus is coming in on. Uh, he references one of the Kirby collages in the annotated stuff. You know, again with the annotated versions, they show a lot of images in their notes, so yeah. you get to see like the pieces that they're talking about. It's kind of cool, and it's one you would recognize. You know, it's one of the more famous of his collages. But you know, they were looking at all that stuff. There it is. The That's pretty wild. Is. The painting of like the lens the sun, flare or whatever. Yeah, really. Uh, I, I dig it, man. See, this is that thing. I feel like it's a Randy Bowen statue that he <laughs> just posed and lit or something. But like the high contrast with the dark kind of craters mm -hmm. and cleavages. He looks and amazing. Reed Richards, not so much in storytelling terms. You know, he looks a little worse for wear. Got a little five o'clock shadow going. I think that was even in the comic. Galactus is a very strange character to, to do this with. I think he looks pretty good throughout most of this, but it's, it is peculiar, you know, like you go, oh, thing looks great or torch looks great. I think Galactus looks pretty good, which is weird, you know? We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> Every page turn though, man, this is where we're going to start to get the boom, the big images, man. I, I love this panel, like just yeah. the scale of that, man, because it's Kaiju, you know, this is Godzilla. Everybody looking up all the time. Yeah. Boom. If you feel the Kirby energy in that. And Galactus is one of those things where it's that inconsistent scale. Because how do you get it to even work at all? Yeah, I was trying to figure out. I figure he's about 60 feet in most of this. My, my, my thoughts were like, I guess when he eats planets, it's like, you know, feel dressing a deer. Like, you're not going to eat that deer for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's going to supply you for like a year. And in his case, maybe you could eat a planet for like a decade. <laughs> Yeah, which would be a blink of an eye in intergalactic terms. We're such fucking dorks. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. That's more, amazing. More carby energy. Busting out the airbrush a touch. I dig that a lot. I, I think that's awesome. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Dude, the big man is getting knocked down, dude. <laughs> yeah. Hulk Hogan against the ropes one time, two time. Trying to get the big man down. That's now, tough. Now, this is the one. This is the one where it makes you think about Ultraman, or it makes you think about the behind-the-scenes footage of Godzilla flicks whenever... I love that stuff. The guy takes his mask off, and, you know, the little grip is giving him a sip through a straw. Of, and they're surrounded uh, by the miniature city. <laughs> yeah, because he posed a friend with some freaking Seth cardboard cutout bullshit, like, on his head, and it really looks like an unfortunate photograph of like a cosplayer that like needs help up. Yeah, th this doesn't work right. There's lighting stuff that's real strange. Like I think Galactus might be lit in a way that's different than the city. It it just this is this is a peculiar image. I looked at this a long time. I read the annotations for it. I think I might have even looked at the original stuff to figure out like he's, is he floating? Like he's not touching the cars. It's just all weird. <laughs> It's funny. I kind of like mark. that it's in here Me for too. that reason. It's great. It, it does break up some of the successful parts, but it's it's kind of a cool image, you know? <laughs> Just really weird. It's a real well-executed piece, but you feel for the person. It feels like a photo. green screen where you put the wrong background on the green screen. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I really do just think of like... A cosplayer who thinks they're the shit and they're go-to thing and then they fall and they're like, help me out. Well, that's why I mentioned like that Warhol exhibit. They would show a lot of the photos right. <laughs> and it would be like a dude on a coffee table in an apartment. You know, it's part of the magic. There he is, man. The dude that they sent out first. His name? Punisher. Ah, uh, right. Yep. Punisher 1. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable the amount of 
illustration that's in this. Relatively man, fast worker, man. I he, he mean, has he's a put system. out a lot of pages. He has a system, and and uh, the thing is, though, I think he's he's got that that Kirby bug, where he just puts in the work. Because yeah. when you see him working, it's not like his hand is moving at light speed. I think it's a very daunting, takes a long time. He just has no problem putting in that 15 hour day every day. I think you're right. And man, every page turn, where every it's page this turn. full page, big image, it's so successful. It's such a good formal choice. It's a little Kirby crackle in there even, man. So it's like, you're trying to get this like realistic approach, but he's still gonna have some comics idiom that, that we know and love. I think that's Kirby Usiek, by the way. <laughs> And this is the big story, you know? It's the first kind of, like, multi-issue, like, like big story in Marvel Comics. So epic. And there's your Kirby hand. Yeah. And a beautiful surfer with the reflection of the fire and stuff. I saw a photo of this, like, his reference for this, where I think it was an action figure that... I don't know if he painted it to really get it, you know, that color, but then hit it with all these different lights in order to figure out where do you have reflections coming off of it. But that's level, amazing. Man. And I I love the Kirby hand. The, that's such a Kirby-esque image. Wow. That's where I was thinking he's about 60, like six stories tall. Man, he'll be eating the earth for a thousand years. The thing about that uh, that trilogy, too, is it is a deus ex machina ending with the ultimate nullifier. And everybody's confused, and I bet it mirrors the reader of the day where it's like, what? What? Three months for this? See, this is a weird shot, because if you think of a lot of these shots would work as somebody taking pictures, a journalist taking pictures, this one does the camera? And I wonder if that's the black and white stuff, because there are a few of those images. The name war in book one right. is that kind of thing where it's like people telling the story versus like, somebody you know photographing it right so i don't know if that's what how you're supposed to interpret that or what yeah good call man i, I didn't think about that the publisher calls galactus a hoax <laughs> <laughs> you know what that holds up really well now for sure oh yeah that that thing that we all just saw we didn't see that did yeah. we see that how big was that crowd oh yeah there's our first peter parker introduction I don't like this one. I think that one's great. This is Tobey Maguire, I feel like, man. And this one is Steve-O from Jackass. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool to set him up as, you know, Parker, another photojournalist, but one who's just exploiting Spider-Man. It's kind of great to see that dynamic between he and Phil. Two different, uh, apparently two very differently motivated photographers. Uh, here's the model for uh, Kingdom Come, that old preacher guy. That's probably Alex Ross's dad or somebody. Yeah, it Something probably close. is. A lot of these models are repeated throughout his work. And I guess, uh, you know, he has close access to Don Knotts, too. <laughs> or is that John Waters? Or is that Steve Buscemi? Or is it all three? It ends with the people, you know, taking advantage, talking a little shit on... It's the X-Men that, that, that sort of triggers him, to use a modern phrase. Clear skies. It's all good. Where are the heroes? Good stuff, man. This was a great piece of nostalgia, too, because it follows, like, 1963's, the other one of these, like, 90s superhero comics, as we're thinking about, you know, flex and, and alternative points of view and new superhero directions. That 1963 stuff is still fresh, you know? At the time, I mean, it's, it's the 30 years anniversary of, like, the Marvel Universe, so this stuff was big, you know? The Galactus story was something that I remember they would reprint periodically and you would get access to as a reader. Like, this was sort of... The, it made perfect sense with what you were reading or what you were uh, coming across. Yeah. And here we are, man. This is the the big one that, uh, you know, our friends who have comic shops, Shouts to Shelton down there at Heroes. That's who I always find. think of with Spider-Man. A couple other guys. I think maybe Ron Friends is, is a dude who um, cites this as being an important kind of era of comics reading for him. And we were following the tra trajectory of Shelton's kind of career uh, for like two issues. He's been trying to put together the book. The book is out now. And it's amazing to read this knowing we know what that means, you yeah. know? And, and so I don't think we spoil anything to say the famous Gwen Stacy story is Spider-Man fails to save Gwen Stacy's life. Yeah. And as a reader, like, wow, did that have, you know, that hit readers real hard that weren't used to that. And that's what's set up. This whole thing has been set up as Phil believing in these superheroes. They will always save the day. They will be there. They will save us. And, and Spider-Man having perhaps some hand in killing the girl 
And his point of view with this is he's so disgusted by popular opinion of these superheroes and the wishy-washy public uh, opinion of them. His plan is to clear Spider-Man's name. Spider-Man's been accused of killing uh, her father. Yeah. Uh, what's some Pol- police Captain Stacy? We'll call. Okay, him. good enough. I can't think of his first name, but that's it. And so Phil sets out to like he's going to solve this. He's going to write a book ex- proving Spider-Man's innocence. Go Go era Black Widow. Yeah, a little Black Widow appearance. That's fun. There's a great... How good is this? This was used a lot. I would see this in promo art. That's the one, like, if he used some... Ref- I bet he had a, a film still of, like, the, the VHS of this show. Around this around this time on the Sci-Fi Channel, on holidays, like, like Easter, Thanksgiving, they would have, and I think I still have the, my tapes, the Mighty Marvel Marathon. Like, 24 hours of every Marvel thing that existed. So it was all shit. It would be, like, the <laughs> Doctor Strange TV show from the 70s. Every episode of this, every episode of Lou Ferrigno's uh, Incredible Hulk, plus the movies with Bullseye and, and I mean, Daredevil and, right. and Thor. It would be... It would take three VHS tapes. And, <laughs> and I wouldn't doubt that... Uh, that Ross, uh, you know, had had his stuff recording on EP. This was really, I, I would look at this stuff. He wasn't the only guy doing this. Like Steve Rude would do this a little bit, but it was the, we're not going to draw every muscle. If he's wearing yeah. some costume, then, you know, how does the fabric actually look? And that was something I would start to think about around this time because you would see this stuff and be like, that's a really cool Spider-Man and it's not all the muscles everywhere. And and this makes more sense. You know, this is what spandex looks like or something. How 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 tough that little put because like if you're going to go for the realistic approach you got to think of perspective and like that part right there just almost becomes a grid it kind of betrays like every spider-man you've ever seen but it's like it you have to do that if, if you're going to try to sell it on as fabric also that mask is so death uh death ray like yeah you know, with the eyes and stuff lucho shit oh man total lucho and he he decides like we'll see it later he is it, like a reflective material to the white I thought the Luke Cage really looks great. Love the way, it, you know, he's not in there much, but the portrayal of Luke Cage, I think is really cool. Feel 70s. I love all the material. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is a dude that could, you could see him at Studio 54. Yeah. It's fun interpretations of most of this. And this is cool too, because this is unreliable narrator sequence where we witness a fight between Doc Ock, Spider-Man. And what happens, man? Spider-Man gets so mad that he throws a chimney on a bunch of people. A little incongruous. And there's Captain uh, Stacy. He's going to... Pretty good Captain Stacy and the rubble that he pulls out. You see like his foot sticking out. Yeah. You know, really man down. And that's menacing, him carrying that body into the red. Totally. And it's it's a lot of shots that you would never see. Like this this is not uh, what you're going to see in a John Romita comic. Right. J. Jonah is talking smack on uh, Spider... Like it's a no-win situation for Spider-Man. Uh if Spider-Man doesn't save the day, he's a piece of shit. But when he does get involved, maybe he's the inactor. This is a stand-in for, like, internet commenters. That's what's amazing is how perfect... It, he works better now than he did 30 years ago. Totally. Because, like, he just doesn't like Spider-Man. So there's nothing that you could do to please that person. But it also is such a perfect way to sell papers. It's so exploitative, his his whole kind of angle on this. Ross is really good, too, with period garb and, and style and shit like that. So, like, that's that dude's perfect, you know? And <laughs> and you we're going to see a lot more sideburns in this issue. I think that's <laughs> there, there we go. that he does really well that most superhero artists, especially at this time, did not. You right. know, like, that was the thing. Everybody could draw the muscles and, and the characters, but the the street scene the people in a coffee shop good luck yeah. that was like the last skill set that we all had everybody's cut everybody's chiseled visits doc ock to find out this is phil investigating the spider-man incident and talking to witnesses and the story just does not nobody totally believes that spider-man did this right except maybe jameson and who even knows you know he's selling papers so who knows what he believes but why would doc ock come clean yeah nothing a, in it for him it's a good doc ock man has some Hannibal Lecter energy. Yeah, it's really good use of lighting of him sliding under the shadow of the bunk. A little smile. Gwen Stacy, Captain Stacy's daughter, goes to talk to her. She's come around on Spider-Man. Beautiful acting in this piece right here, man. Real innocence. These nice quaint homes, too. Like, it's like, it feels legit. And this is an era, like, this guy had to, like, source these references with practical stuff. 
I've been watching more period stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, there should be wallpaper. Uh, <laughs> everything was, I feel like everything was wallpaper back then. I can understand him not wanting to do it, but seeing like the tablecloth makes me think of that whenever I read this scene of like, oh yeah, there were a lot of patterns at this time period. I still want to ask Lynn Varley how she would do like her pa her quilt and her wallpaper texture where it's like, how do you, just painting that symbol, you know, that ornate symbol one time is tough. And Ross, man, you don't need to do this in the background walking down the street. It's great that he does. That's the same as like the costuming to me is like, how do we decorate a street for this? Yeah, some, some artists selling their wares on the street. Wonderful. This is a cool scene. This is Namor is invading because there's some hostage that he wants to free. And so he brings basically the forces of Atlantis, but it has this very ethereal quality of like alien invasion, something uh, spectacular. And he achieves it with this color where these are all in these blue gray washes, kind of like lighter and a little bit desaturated. And then you have the warm of these characters walking through and Gwen Stacy just being sort of impressed by all of this. It's, it's a nice moment, I think, for highlighting what this stuff is. All it's right. almost like this super technology that has invaded the world and how, you know, if you just pause for a second and don't be afraid, you're in awe of what you're seeing. And I'll say it just because we'll get a million comments asking us why we didn't say it. There's Night Owl, right. there's Silk Spectre, Watchmen, and Star Wars Probe Droid. And what are the two views and more they get, man? Coming and going. Right. Pretty good, man. It's, it's, you know, seeing an airplane fly overhead. I don't know what that smoke signifies in the first panel. It's like, it's like a uh, cause, effect. You yeah, know? maybe. Yeah, I guess so. Whenever they were doing the Sam Raimi Spider-Man flick, there was like a test test video you can find it on uh on youtube where they did like a, a pra like a john ramita green goblin kind of kind of face mask that had articulate and you remember that was willem dafoe mm -hmm. so the mask kind of like still looks like willem dafoe and makes me think of this right here i like this a lot i, I think that's fun the i don't know, smoke from his his device coming it, out it's a pretty good sequence there's there's very little because we're going on a tour through the Marvel Universe, there's very little like page to page to page kind of flow throughout this whole thing. You, you know, big spans of time can transpire between panels even. So this is the one of the, the sequences that's like, you know, it's multiple pages, probably for like most of the rest of the issue. And Sheldon is going to see Gwen Stacy, sees, sees the goblin taker and pays a, a, a hack to uh, take him as close as possible. He's got to He's got to get there, try to help the girl, or at least bear witness, we'll say. This is a good sequence. And it was a good setup. You know, like they make you believe he's grown close to Gwen Stacy. So that part's great. She's in peril. There's some personal stakes there for him. Uh, but we always talk about car stuff is really hard to, fought, to, to make convincing and follow and dynamic. It does all that stuff. Even, even having to leave the car on foot, very easy to follow. And period specific cars, by the way. This is 70s film. French Connection cars. This feels like where we start to deviate from some of the photo referencing, and I dig it, but it does feel different. You know, this feels very different than the ground level lighting is all accurate. Good pose here. You see the use of the horizontals have gone away now, and uh, our, our panels are losing some of their, their, their base, their strength, their solidity. There it is, man, the epic uh, neck snapper. That's one of those compositional things that's that's strange because it looks like she's a she's. It, it doesn't those lines right under her face. That's a bad choice. It looks like, like a ledge. Like oh she right, was right, about right. to slam into a ledge and he stopped her. Right, you know I what, what I mean. Saying, like yeah. it's when I read that the first time, it was like, oh, he stopped her from hitting this this ledge, but it's not a ledge. It's just a really unfortunate spot to put a line. And look, man, you can put those lines anywhere. It, right. it didn't have to be an inch under her nose. That's a weird piece. The He's weight doesn't work here either. You mm -hmm. know, like her arms aren't right. Like those arms should have kept going. You know, like if you're going to show that she stopped suddenly and it caused this snap, the arms wouldn't be where they're at there. Yeah, yeah. It's There's like... just a lot that doesn't work in that image. And it's a shame because that's a climactic. Mo that is the climactic moment of the series. And it doesn't work. I think it's super close to, uh, to, Probably. to what the, the comic did. And... You know, like whenever you watch like a 
boxing match or something, you see somebody's head snap. It's so severe and like it's like the grossest thing ever to That's me. That's exactly what I thought of here. Like you, you can kind of tell a lifeless or at least an unconscious body. You see it in all these sporting events when somebody gets knocked out on their feet and it's like suddenly gravity just like everything just is affected. And considering how accurate he is with stuff like lighting, which is physics, I'd love to see it with this weight. Like, this is the one moment where we need weight. Right. Yeah, I just... And I I hate to shit on it this much because, like, so much of this book blew me away. I was so impressed by it, but it's such a big moment. It's such a big moment. If this was page three, panel seven, who cares? It's not. This is your moment. I think he's, you know, like, as a big kind of comics fan of this era i i think he just didn't want to draw something so ugly that's just it too i wonder if there's a whole different way to present it you know maybe from phil's point of view where he's seeing it from a long way off and 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 there's some way to show like her flailing and then her limp right that's fair i I don't know you know but i'm just saying to me this this paused when i was reading it sure so not ideal but again hate to say it because i feel like everything else is so good (laughs) On the very next page, Norman Osborn dead. And of course, this is the regular people, man, so they don't make any connections to uh, Green Goblin and uh, our guy. It's it's cool to see how uh, how Ross tries to interpret that weird Ditko hair. Yeah, very Nixon-esque. Yeah. And and Phil is like PTSD almost. You know, this is this is the uh, the cult that you've been following the day after they predicted you would be sucked into the spaceship or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and we sort of follow the the family story is an important part throughout too because he you know didn't want to get married to the girl if he couldn't protect her and then he married her anyway developed a family but still was spending so much time on his book wasn't uh spending much time with the family that's all changed now he he knows kind of what's important in life or whatever yeah, and has become very successful throughout the course of this. Yeah. Has a pretty good arc. You know, you see him in the very beginning sitting on the car fender talking with his buddies about what they want to do. And we see him here passing off a lot of his work onto his assistant as he moves into retirement. This is kind of a, a funny piece. He pulls the paper boy in for this photo of the family. Yeah. Which is weird that you would pull a random kid in. Uh, the notes say it's the idea of regular. Like, that's a regular kid. Pull him in. Of course, it's Danny Catch. Yeah, on... Who, Look at that man on a on a bike. Who know? we know as the Ghost Rider of our generation started in 1990 as the new Ghost Rider that was real popular. Midnight Suns all spinning out of the popularity of that Ghost Rider series. So another one of those Easter eggs, but a, a good one for you know a kid of 90s comics. They had to they had to squeak one more Easter egg in, man, before before they cut out. And also, I think that's like very close to like Paperboy, like the NES colors. There it is, man. In a nutshell, dude, uh, the 90s was was a pretty tough time in comics. There's very little good stuff uh, to, to come out on a, any sort of regular basis. You had to get it where, get it in where you could fit it in. And this was one of the highlights of what Marvel was putting out at that time. Great covers, too. You know, like, they, they really nailed this series in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways that often go wrong. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're reading whatever comics, it's rare that you get this much success in a series. I'm not the biggest Alex Ross fan, His DC stuff really didn't do much for me, and that's most of what I had read coming into this. I could not have been more pleased with this. That's a good place to leave it, Jimmy. Cut out? Yeah. K-Favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jim's got a gang of comics in the shops right now. Street Angel for Image, Octobriana, Plain Jane's is out there in bookstores as well. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing Red Room. Uh, X-Men Grand Design Omnibus is sold out at my level, at the publisher level, but you you should be able to find some of those in stores until they're completely sold out. It'll be reprinted in 2021 at some point. The Ed Piscor Studio Studio Edition is is uh, is going fast, and you can find it at a steep discount on fanographics.com, amazon.com, and it's in some better comic shops everywhere, we'll say. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video. I encourage you to do that because it is hard to keep up with everything we do, especially through social media with their algorithms limiting maybe our reach. Uh, You can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise also at the links below this video. Give them one more set of merchant orders, Jimmy. Read more comics.